I don't blame I don't blame the young the young people. I mm -hmm. I blame myself, and I I I blame our this the. The the, the 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 system we put them in. Hi everybody, my name is Andrea Leom. I'm a photo journalist, and this is what the photo uh, YouTube channel that I been producing for a while now, where I talk about photo journalism, about journalism, about life, about ideas, and uh, I make interviews with other photographers and other people that. I believe are important uh, people creating and debating and uh, discussing important ideas. And today uh, it's a little bit different because I'm not in uh, I'm not at home right now. Uh, I'm in Brazil on an assignment, so I had some uh, problems to edit and post a video that should have been posted yesterday. So uh, without further say, today I'm talking with uh, Kenneth Jarek. Uh, an American photographer that um, you know made probably one of the most iconic pictures of the Gulf War in the early 90s, in the beginning of the 90s, 1991, when the U.S. had to invade or to stop the Iraq invasion of Kuwait. And Kenneth, he was um, it, that was a very, very, very severe. You know, the, the the American government, the American military, had an ex extreme like surveillance upon journalists, uh, controlling uh, or controlling very much what could be published and not published. It was a very hidden, you know, war. But Kenneth. He made um, one of the pictures that uh, probably the most iconic picture of that war and possibly one of the most iconic pictures uh, war uh, photographs ever made. Um, I will leave you here um, now to, to listen to our conversation. Uh, Kenneth is a very, you know, um, I felt uh, I never talked to him before, but I felt it was um, a very enriching conversation, but uh, in many, many ways, you know, I've, uh, it was a kind of a generation, uh, difference of generation between his uh, generation as a photographer and mine. I think that these people in the 90s, in the 80s, and even before, they were doing something that um, were, was not very much about words, but very much about you know photography. Because at the time, newspapers, magazines, they were still publishing uh, very well, like you know photojournalism. Today, you know, I think we are in a different phase where it's time to debate, it's time to reflect, it's time to think about the mistakes and the good things that uh, had done we we photojournalists have done before. And uh, well, you know, without further say, I leave you here to to enjoy um, and hopefully to learn with uh, Kenneth Jarek. Thank you very much, everybody. Hello. Hi. How are you doing? Doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing well. It's good to uh, see you. You can see me well, or yeah, see hear yeah. me well. Very nice. Yes, thank you. How about uh, on your end? How are you, Jake? I'm I'm doing well. Where Where are you now exactly? I'm in Montana, and it just started to snow, so we got that. <laughs> Wasn't it snowing before? Just now. Just uh, two minutes ago, it started. Yeah. Yeah, here too in Italy, we start, we got the first snow yesterday. Oh, really? Yeah. Where in Italy are you? In the south part of Italy, near Na Naples. Have you been here? Uh, just uh, Torino is all I've been. All right, uh, that's very far, far north. No, no, no that's that's more snow. That's I yeah. was Winter Olympics. Winter Olympics is why I was there. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. Right. So you actually, you started as a sport photographer, right? 
yeah, uh, that's all. That's all we had. Uh, I, I grew up in a a rural area, you know, small state, and sports was basically all we had that I could, you know, get published shooting sports, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, but you moved to New York. Yes. Right. I moved to New York. I started working with uh, contact press images. I wanted to. Uh, I wanted to be a magazine photographer. But this is uh, this is one thing. Like you know, for example, you come from a small town, where probably people, not many people, are like readers of Life magazine or Time magazine or New York Times, and so on. And I mean, I, I have the same background basically. Like you know, the community where where I come from, they were not reading big newspapers and so on. But what made you decide that this is the place where I want to express myself? How may what called your attention for that thing? Well, I, I I had a lot of success early on when I was still in college locally, and I, I realized I could do this. I could stay in Omaha, Nebraska. I could stay there for the next my entire career, and that would be it. And since I'd already gotten to that point um, before I was even 20 years old. I didn't, I didn't want to stay at that level. And I don't, I don't say that to be rude. I just, I don't, I didn't want to, uh, I wanted to push myself. But was it like, you know, self motivation or were like someone, you know, saying, hey, listen, you should go to New York. This is the big place. There's, yeah. there are the big <laughs> stories, you know. How, how, I mean, what kind of kid were you at the time? Like, you know, like reading well or bad at school? What did you use your time during your, you know? Who kind of person were you then? No, no one encouraged me to go to New York, not a single person. Even uh, the agency that I, that I kind of had a relationship with, contact press images, they didn't encourage me to come there. They were surprised when I showed up. Um, I, I, I became a reader, you know, when I was, uh, maybe 14, I started reading a lot and I, I, I discovered I enjoyed reading. Um, when I picked up a camera, I, I, I discovered, and I didn't pick up a camera till I was 16. Mm -hmm. So then I discovered, uh, the first time that this is something that, I really enjoyed and I, I, I thought I was good at. I wasn't good at it, but I thought I was good at it. And um, so I, uh, I just, uh, I, I wasn't a good student. I went to college to play football. I didn't go to college to study. Right. And um, I don't know, I was, I was competitive. I wanted to prove that that I could do this thing. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I, I I had no business going to New York. Is right. That's probably the, the easy answer. Yeah, because it's interesting. Because I mean, you coming from a small community, going without any specific plan to New York, and then excelling to steps there in in a career for a journalist that I had been like, you know, we, I want to talk with you about that, like, you know, pushing editorial limits, you know, pushing in many aspects. I mean, what did prepare you both like, uh, not just professionally, professionally, okay, but also personally, what kind, you know, I'm very curious about your personality in this sense. You know, I'm not, I'm not always curious about photographer's personality, but about yours, I'm very curious because I mean, what made up this guy that comes from a small place with a, without a specific goal to New York, enters in the moon, in the, in the world of big magazines and big, you know, big stories and push the limits, editorial limits, specifically like in 1991 in, a, in, in Iraq, for example. So I, I don't know if you know, uh, Frank Fournier, yeah, wonderful. Frank Frank Fournier, 
he's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful man, wonderful photographer, um, made many important pictures, but uh, I knew how to work. I knew mm -hmm. how to work. I knew how to work hard as an athlete, right. you know, growing up, you know, I knew how to work. I wasn't afraid to work. And so I, I'm, I, I was talking to, to Frank and he, I said, you know, I'm working as hard as I can. He said, that's not good enough. You have to work as hard as you can. You have to work as smart as you can. And that was, that was kind of, that kind of resonated with me. Mm -hmm. That okay, I start to I'm, I'm starting to okay. It's not just sweat; it has to be it has to be smart sweat. So mm -hmm. maybe that answers that a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, like for example, you know, how is it for you, New York? I've been in New York a few times, like you know, meeting these. Um, newspaper editors, magazine editors, I have done work with them before. Re uh, today, like, you know, I, I basically gave up working with uh, like American press, you know, but right. um, I have done this, you know, this, uh, this, this work too. And one thing that I felt, I mean, maybe one, one point is that I'm not American, you know, but I can imagine you coming from because everywhere is, I mean, America is very different than New York. People in New York think in a very, very specific models, right? How was like to approach these people at that time? This is like how many years before, like 30, 40 years more, 40 years? Um, um, yeah, so I just graduated from high school my first trip there. I just I had a black and white portfolio the first trip I went there. I didn't know anything. And um, why specifically black and white? Because it was to, for you to work, you could work yourself or what, what do you mean? Because I, I was I was a stringer in Omaha for the Associated Press and the local newspaper. So all I shot was black and white. And so um, what I would do is I would call up and I, I had a couple meetings and it took, uh, it took a long time to get these meetings, but I'd call up and I'd start uh, chatting with uh, the person's secretary. I got to know the secretaries of, of the people I wanted to meet with. Um, one, of the, one of them was the uh, director of photography at Sports Illustrated, because mm -hmm. that's all I knew was sports photography. I thought that was photography, right? I didn't mm -hmm. know. Um, and so I went in, and I had a meeting with the director of photography at Sports Illustrated because probably because they, I was a curiosity to them. Um, and so I showed her a black and white newspaper style portfolio. And she's like, you got it. This is a color magazine. You got to shoot color. You got to learn how to shoot color. You got to fill the frame. And she told me a lot of really important things. And, you know, a year later, I went back with a color portfolio. And then she gave me some assignments, you know, it's just, so it's um, my mentality, my mentality, I was, I didn't feel uncomfortable in New York. Mm -hmm. And um, I had, you know, that my first trip overseas, I was 14 years old mm -hmm. and I was a wrestler. Mm -hmm. So a wrestler. I, was a, I was a wrestler. I was 14 right. years old. I was the state uh, in, in my weight class, I won the state championship. And so the junior Olympic team, they had, they had, they put together state teams and they would go and you could go and wrestle in Germany or you could wrestle in Iran. And I chose Iran. So our, our team went to Iran to wrestle um, Iranians, and um, this was the summer before the Ayatollah came back. So the whole country was yeah. um, in a, a desperate situation, riots, you know, the Shah was still there, mm -hmm. um, all this type of thing. And, you know, a couple months later, the uh, U.S. Embassy would be taken, things taken. like this. And so um, I don't know if that was I don't know if that 
started, I wasn't a photographer, I wasn't a journalist, I'd never read a newspaper probably besides a sports page. Um, I don't know if that's what, what started it. Yeah. But, but I, was, I, 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 I was immediately comfortable um, wherever I, so I talk a lot about a, a person's comfort level as a photojournalist. And I don't know what it is, but I'm immediately within hours, I'm comfortable. I'm mm -hmm. comfortable if I don't speak the language, if I don't know the city, if I don't know anybody, I'm comfortable. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Yeah. You know, I mean, because I think that in this time of, uh, you know, this cultural time of the world, like what you describe as, as um, you know, a, a, you know, a wor hard, hard working guy that says, listen, I'm not afraid of working. And then you go and you take the chances and you know what comes off, you do it seriously and slowly things start happening. You know, I think this is a culture that was very effective at that time. And I think it's still effective yeah, today. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's still effective today, but we, I, I meet a lot of young photographers, you know, we have all this mentality around today, oh, it's, you know, all oh, female or black or whatever, you know, and then you try, have you ever tried to speak this, this mentality, say, listen, hard working, work slow, work well, work hard, it doesn't matter who you are, you know, it, maybe it will happen, it's not sure, but if it doesn't help, you tried. You made the best you had because I mean you didn't have any like it wasn't sure that it, things would work well for you, was it? I mean, no, I didn't. I didn't have any money. I sold my car yeah. to move to New York. Um, I didn't. My um, I didn't get money from my parents. I you know like my my grandmother or my aunt would send me a, like a check for three hundred dollars. You know, and mm -hmm. I would live on that for a month or longer. I, I it was always. Uh, I always thought I was always on the verge of failing every, all the time I was there. Right. Always. Did it scare um, you to be in the verge of fa failing? Uh, it made me hungry. Mm -hmm. You know, I just, um, and, and, and sometimes it'd make me angry, but it didn't make me scared. Right. I was, I was, I was hungry and I was driven. And um, I think the difference, the difference today is there was opportunity, more opportunity if, 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 you, if, uh, if you failed at, in, at a certain magazine or if a certain magazine, the editors there didn't like you, there were, there were 20 other magazines, 50 other magazines. To, and that's just in New York City. Right. And a contact, I could shoot something and you know, it would go to Italy and, and Grazia Nera would, would find a place to, you know, right. get a little ink, right? So there were, op that was opportunity. And you don't make a great living, uh, you know, on, on the checks that come from Europe, but it keeps you, it keeps you going, right? Right. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, that's why I, I, I don't know if you've, seen this thing I started I just launched a nonprofit two weeks yeah. ago January 1st mm -hmm. we launched this nonprofit and it's about creating opportunities because we have to disrupt the marketplace mm -hmm. there's no the big the, the big publications have no um, there's no competition there's no reason for them to, to hire a certain photographer or mm -hmm. pay photographers more because they've they've limited the competition, so that's that's why we've started this nonprofit. What do you mean uh, limited the competition? In which way? What did I, what have they done? To, what did they do for for limit the competition? Well, when whenever whenever like I said, whenever I I, I failed at one place, I'd go to another place. Right. Well, now there's two or three places, and if you fail there. Um, there's no other options. You yeah. can't try another door. There's no other doors to try. Um, they're right. just because um, the contracts are so bad mm -hmm. and 
they demand uh, copyright uh, a lot of the times, or they they demand to uh, syndicate uh, photographers' images. So there's no resale. There's no there's no going to to Italy and 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 getting a double truck from a news event um, because the only people that profit from that is the agency because yeah. the photographer signed a contract that you know they get the they get the licensing fee. Mm -hmm. So that, that competition is removed. There's two major newspapers left in this country that still assign photographers. Mm -hmm. um, they both have, they're both, both their contracts are, are poor, not in favor of photographers. Their day rates are, have, have been stagnant for decades. Yeah. yeah, So we need to, we need to create an option for photographers to get paid for their work and retain ownership of their work. That's, that's how you start to break down that, that, that monopoly by creating options for photographers. Mm -hmm. when, I mean, when you first like, where did you make your first foreign assignment? Um, That's a that's a good question. I don't remember. <laughs> you know, when these things happen, um, you think I'm never gonna. I remember the first time bullets were flying through the air, right? And there's bullets bouncing, and and you and and I, and I, and I thought to myself, this is I'm never gonna forget this moment, hmm. and. I haven't forgotten the moment, but I've forgotten the country I was in <laughs> at the time. So um, I think my first real foreign assignment was probably the Seoul Olympics um, in 1988. I think, I mean, I, I remember, I don't know, probably Seoul. You know, I think I went to Northern Ireland before that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I just, uh, you know, it, it's, you don't, you don't, you don't really remember these things or think about these things until you're, you're looking through your archive and then all the, all the moments come back immediately when you see those pictures. Right. You know, but I remember I, I, got, I got into, I got into Seoul, Korea and I was there for Time Magazine to shoot the Olympics and it was about three in the morning and it was a nice, new hotel and I've really never stayed in a hotel that nice or that new obviously mm -hmm. and um and I looked out the window and I'm looking across the, the city of and and I thought this is this is uh this is really a big moment this is a big this is a big assignment and this is a, a big opportunity and the only reason I got that opportunity was because uh another photographer had dropped out and my agent Robert Pledge uh, convinced Time to to bring me on as as that uh, to take that photographer's place. You know, get that credit. It was a last minute thing, mm -hmm. and I ended up getting the, that was my first time cover the Seoul Olympics. So that was a big deal. You know, and I mean, then you the, to the Middle East. Did you were you sent there on an assignment or? At did you go on your own? How did you, how did you end up like in the Middle East in the at the end of the eighties, start of nineties, like th this period? I um, well, I did the, the the Gulf War. I did the Gulf War for a very specific reason. Mm -hmm. I was uh, I was working a lot in Washington D.C. You know, I started as a sports photographer, but then somehow I became a political photographer. And then In I the White became, House, right? Well, yeah, you know, I'd work the White House, Senate, whatever, right? Just the city, and um, so I knew how to, um, I knew how to deal with bureaucracy. I knew how to, to everything in Washington D.C. is very controlled. You're always standing behind a velvet rope, and the Department of Defense created. Uh, a pool system for things like the Gulf War. And 
the the normal the the seasoned war photographers they don't they don't necessarily know how to deal with uh, bureaucrats and and I was and I was watching the coverage come out before the war started and it was always like you know a camel with a tank with a sunset and it was very there was no uh, pictures of that showed a certain um, there was no pictures of people, mm -hmm. people that would be affected by this, people that were um, there sent in harm's way. There's no, there's no personal connection to the images I was seeing coming out of the Gulf. So I was under contract for Time Magazine and, and my editor, the director of photography didn't want to send me. I convinced her to send me um, because I knew how to work in Washington DC and that would be a very important skill I right. felt and so that's that's how I ended up there right so you you know let's talk about your decision because you know the um, to take the picture of that Iraq soldier you know what I mean what was this decision about was this decision more if you think about this today more on the basis of your journalistic instincts, values, or your personal emotions, uh, or you know your political ideology. I mean, what what motivated you? Because I mean, you had to fight for this picture, right? You had to actually say, "Listen," and I, I think your phrase about that is one of the most important, uh, you know phrase that I have, uh, I mean, in, in photography, one of the most important phrases in war photography says that if, I mean, if I'm wrong, but if if we are strong enough to go to war, we should be strong enough to see war, right? Something like, yeah. you yeah. know, yeah. well, I mean, because that specific event, I know of journalists that even lost their work because they want to to put on there like videos or to note it to, you know, but you stood for that. I mean, how, how, what made you there? Who were like this young guy who didn't have a specific plan that they had already, you know, faced a lot of things and then was there, boom, that moment. Cause this is a, a very, you know, if you call about the decisive moment, this it can be more decisive than that. At, at the time, I had no grand idea. Mm -hmm. I had no grand thoughts about any of this. Mm -hmm. I, I was making, I was just trying to make a picture of record. Mm -hmm. you, the, so this, this war had been going on and I assumed that everybody else had made better pictures than this, more important pictures. I, I, I had no expectations. I was just wanted to record the situation. I just wanted to make a picture of record. No great um, philosophical thoughts were behind that image. At that moment and place, in front yes. of that, in front of that wreckage, like right. yeah. Right. How old were, was, were you at the time? I was like 26 or 27. Mm -hmm. Right. And you made, and then when, when did you see the picture the first time after you take it? So, you know, the interesting things didn't happen till after that image was made because we didn't know what was happening. You know, everybody talks about the fog of war and that's a real thing. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, uh, that was in Iraq. It was about 70 or 80 miles north of uh, Kuwait City. And so between and, and so that's on a big, you know, interstate. It's very right. nice, very easy to drive on. Um, we, we were trying to get into Kuwait City, and the ceasefire had been called. So we kept heading south on this road. And we ran into the Iraqi, uh, the Republican Guard, which was their elite forces. Mm -hmm. And they started shelling us. And so we had to turn around and um, we didn't really have any place to go. We were between, we didn't have a, 
we're just two vehicles, two, two, a public affairs officer, a sergeant, and our press pool. There was, that was it. There was no grand convoy or caravan. So or, you were trapped in the middle between the... Yeah. Wow. What? <laughs> wow. So, so we, didn't, we didn't have any place to go because uh, right. we, we, had, we had left our, the military uh, unit we were traveling with. And so we decided to, uh, very foolish decision, to de we decided to drive cross country because we had a map <laughs> and there were kind of roads on the map. And um, so, and it was only 70 miles. And so um, we started driving towards Kuwait City, trying to avoid the, the Republican Guard. And we drove through, you know, you'd drive through and you'd, you'd realize there were blown up vehicles and you'd realize you're in the middle of a minefield. That happened several times. Um, we got lost, we got lost. And so that the image, the, the important image you talk about, that was made about seven o'clock in the morning about, and we only had 70 miles to go, but 70 miles through the desert in the middle of a war is it's a really immense. long distance. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we tried to circle around and get back to the highway and avoid the Republican guard. And so and it's, it's, there's oil fields burning, so you can see at night, there's plenty of light. Mm -hmm. um, and so we finally got back after being lost and almost running out of fuel. We lost a vehicle in the middle of a minefield. We're all in one vehicle now. Anyways, we get back to the highway about three in the morning. So that's whatever, that's, that's almost like, that's like 20 hours. Right. And we get back to the highway and we're now we know we're about uh, you know 30 miles from Kuwait City maybe and we're on the highway and we're cruising and things look good and um and we've been up you know nobody slept in four or five days and so um everybody's drifting off and we're all crammed into this one vehicle and I look up and we're in the middle of a parking lot Mm -hmm. And uh, I say, the sergeant is driving, I say, Todd, um, wh why'd you get off the interstate? Why are we in this parking lot? And he said, uh, I didn't get off the interstate. I don't know, I don't know where we are. Mm -hmm. And so he stopped the vehicle and he went out to scout around and I got out of the vehicle and I'm looking around and um, this parking lot, a lot of the vehicles, they're all kind of scattered and haphazard. And I realize I can hear a radio playing and a radio here playing. And, and some of these vehicles are still running. And, and then I realize there's, there's, there's machine guns set up in defensive positions and all this kind of stuff. And I don't know where Todd went, the driver. And so I wake up, I wake up our public affairs officer and I'm, I said, I don't know where we are, but uh, this isn't good. And um, then Todd comes back, you know, like 10 minutes later and we, we just start weaving our way through these vehicles and it takes us an hour to get through there or more. And finally we get out and we're on the, the highway again. And an hour later, or 30 minutes later, we're in Kuwait city and the sun is rising. And we had no idea what happened, right? It was very strange. And three days later, three days later, uh, I'm sitting in a cafe with uh, uh, a couple of TV journalists, sound man, producer, cameraman. And this producer comes up and she's, she says, you won't believe what we just discovered. It's this thing we're calling it the highway of death and there's all these vehicles, blah, blah, blah. And so the, the three of us are like, yeah, we, we, we drove through there a couple nights ago accidentally. Yeah, wow. She, we didn't know what it was called. Right. <laughs> and it was three in the morning. And she goes, you couldn't have driven through there. We couldn't even walk through there. There were so many, so many uh, cluster bombs and yeah. boot and everything. So 
the the things that happened after um, making that image were um, a lot more interesting than than the, the just but making so the image. So you went back to make the picture. Or you make the picture. You made the picture when while you went through the 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 the, the road. We made the picture north of the highway of death. Ah, it was in the north. Okay, right. Yeah. We wow. In the north, and then we drove and. And we finally got back there. Listen, like but there were like away. many kilo, many like many miles of destroyed cars and yeah. everything, right? Yeah, and we drove through it. No survivors. There were no no survivors. No one survived. I don't know. I don't right. know. But we were we were driving through it like you know, foolish people, I guess. Well, that that happens. Yeah. Wow. You know. <laughs> I have been in situations like that too, was, you know, no, similar to it. Wow, it's amazing. And then, and then we, you want to publish these pictures, but they said no, right? Or they were like, you know, not really interested or ready to publish it. And this is something that, you know, I mean, you know, like I have been once, I, I never wanted to, you know, I never, I never liked to make them embedded you know, work. And this was one of the reasons that, one of the reasons that I always like, you know, Iraq or Afghanistan never really, <clears throat> at least not during the 2000s interested me so much because most of the work were doing bad. At. But um, many people that work in this first like Gulf War, they mentioned how the government were just like rude and say, no, you won't publish anything or they were like, really hard on like stopping people to say th something. But then in the 2000, like after 9-11, Iraq and Afghanistan, they say, oh, you want access? I will give you access. Come with me, embedded. And, you know, everything changed. How do you think that the, 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 the rhetoric, like the narrative end, uh, changed from your generation to the next generation? And newspapers, how did newspapers, especially editors, what kind of editors do you, you know, what happened with the editors? Because they, they couldn't be so very good at your time because they were not trying to try not to publish your picture. But I think they became even worse after. I don't know. What's your opinion or your take on that? Well, I knew, I knew the situation I was getting into. Right. I knew, I knew how Washington, D.C. worked. I felt I could work within that system to get access that I wouldn't have gotten otherwise. Mm -hmm. Now, during the first Gulf War, there were a lot of um, people working unilaterally outside of the pool system. They, it was very dangerous. They, uh, they, uh, there was no safe ground for them because the, the coalition forces, they could arrest them on site. Um, and a lot of people did get arrested. The Iraqi forces, you know, who know, there were, there was no safe haven for them, but they did great work and they made, you know, important images. Um, something like Afghanistan, it just, it, it became more and more difficult. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily blame the, the photographers or their editors, it just became more difficult. And if you think about Abu Ghraib or something like this, that reportage came from actual soldiers with their, their cell phones. Um, mm -hmm. it's a, it, we're living in a, a different world. And a lot of the times, the reason the Department of Defense or another, uh, another country's uh, government facilitates journalism is, is because uh, they think that it'll give them an advantage in the uh, public opinion. Um, the Crimean War, the British sent two photographers to the Crimean War, you know, when mm -hmm. photography was just invented to, uh, to document the, the uh, the, the conditions of this war and how they were doing things the right way and it backfired on them. Mm -hmm. um, the Spanish-American War, that war was, 
That war was basically started by two competing newspaper chains because they wanted content to sell their newspapers. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've got a, we've got, and so now, you know, flash forward to, to the 1990s when this happened, um, does it, does it hurt their narrative to, uh, or does it hurt their ability to, to sell perfume or a new car if you have a picture like that in the middle of your magazine? I don't know what their motive, I, I, I don't know, I don't know why they do the things they do, but yeah. they, they, uh, in my opinion, the reason that journalism isn't what it should be today is I don't blame it on governments, I, I blame it on, on publications and the, the journalists themselves. I mean, you can do a better job, you mm -hmm. can, um, you can fight for important uh, stories to be seen and published. But, uh, you know, 30 years ago, you could, you could have an important conversation with your editor at a newspaper or a magazine. And you could, it could be heated, it could be angry, it could be aggressive, it could be all, all these things, but you'd still go to dinner with that person and, and, and have a nice conversation after work. It wasn't personal. Have, it wasn't personal. It was, it was about uh, you know, the ethics, the directions of the magazine you wanted to go and things like this. But now, because we go back to the lack of opportunity out there for journalists, journalists today don't dare speak up. Yeah. They don't dare because they know that there's not if they lose their job, they're out of journalism and now they're in public relations because there's no other options out there. They can't go from uh, one newspaper to another newspaper or one magazine to another magazine. There just doesn't exist anymore, the options. Hmm. So it, 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 it hampers them. I mean, because this is something like, you know, like this, um... I can see the photographers like in the 80s and, uh, and so on, like they had one of the main, I think, uh, what people today call glamour, you know, I would call personality because they were like, you know, many people with very, very, very strong personalities, right? And yeah, today, Today they have, I mean, today it's more like followers than personality, I don't know. Well, you have to understand, if you, if you understand, and you know, you, you know this, you know the mentality of a photographer, mm -hmm. the, the, the arrogance to say, to tell an editor, I'm going, I'm, send, me to the, send me to a war, mm -hmm. because I will make a picture that's important and then you, that, that nobody else will make. Mm -hmm. that's a crazy statement to make yeah but as photographers we always made those kind of statements if you're if you're working in washington dc and there's a hundred photographers at an event what kind of a person says i'm going to get the best picture here and that was the attitude across the everybody thought that right mm. Yeah, there's a there's there's you, you hold yourself to a, a level that's almost um, unachievable, and you swing for that level, and you might not hit that level, but you're playing so hard you do hit a great level. Mm. I don't know that that I don't I don't know that there's the motivation to do that or what if you make a great image today. What's your motivation? Because you can be fired tomorrow for, for um, saying the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or crucified. Yeah, basically crucified. But yeah, you know, I think that you know the the environment today. It's very like you know, uh, people have to really be really 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 careful about what they say, how they, where they go, who they talk with. You know, I mean, you know, in, in, in my country, I think that is not, it's some, maybe some similarities with the US, 
but for example, you know, if you are on Facebook and as a journalist, I always put it like, oh, you know, I follow the, my, the president's website on Facebook, Bolsonaro. And then people start, oh, you are following Bolsonaro, why? <laughs> you know, say, well, because I'm a journalist, <laughs> you know? Right. And then you have to explain that, you know, even like, it's almost like it's, you know, or for example, I would tell you like, uh, I often receive messages from journalists, students, like people that are going to the college, college to learn journalism, and oh, I want to write my final paper and could I talk with you and say, well, for sure, let's talk. But the quality of these students are a few times so embarrassing, bad. And recently I had a conversation with a girl and I had to, you know, she didn't know what NATO was. She didn't know what Kofi Annan was. She had no idea about, you know, the Balkans war, nothing, right? And I, I had to, I said, listen, man, it's, it becomes difficult to talk with you if you don't know the basic of history. And, you know, whatever, she started crying. And then, you know, she wrote me an email back on, if I was less chauvinist, I would, uh, you know, I would have learned many things. And then at one point I said, listen, I, I, maybe I, I should stop talking with the female students because, you know, or at least the students that, look at my work on social media, that's too bad. You know, how, how do you deal with that? I mean, you, how do you observe it from your point of view? Like, you know, your vantage point where you are now, because you are a family man today, right? You are a farmer, right? You went back and I mean, this is reality, isn't it? Like being a father, being a husband, taking care of the garden, this is reality. This is something that you start to finish and you see the results of that, but you 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 have all this experience. How do you observe the world in re, in, in terms of reality today? I um, I think I think uh, a lot of what you're talking about. I don't uh, I don't blame I don't blame the young the young people. I mm -hmm. I blame myself, and I I I blame our this the. The the, the 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 system we put them in. Mm -hmm. I think I could have done better. And people people say, you know, they they. they I th I think if 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 someone doesn't understand what happened, or have basic knowledge of something that happened ten years before, uh, uh, they were born. How can you know? Do we blame them or do we blame ourselves for not teaching them properly? Mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to. Um... Well, but who teach you? We're teaching you. You know, you say that no one. Okay. Will teach you. Yeah. You know, these, I mean, these. Maybe this. This. That's the point. Like because you know, sometimes I feel like, oh man, I know that. I have this exactly same feeling that you have, but you know. At some point, can we really infantilize them so much? Because I mean, no one were teaching you, as you said before. I mean, you, you know, I, I'm not I'm trying to blame them. It's just like, you know, or not either I'm trying to find something, a bad answer for a nihilistic answer for the world, but you know, uh, maybe a realistic po start point where you can start like, you know, touching reality. I think that, uh, I mean, to answer your first question, I learned from other other photographers, and I, the, and I, and and some some of these are people that you know, some of these are people that are highly respected, and some of them you've never heard of, would never see a single picture they made, but they, I learned something from all of them, mm -hmm. and I was hungry for knowledge, and. There was a, you couldn't, so there were, there were the, knowledge, inform, not knowledge, but information was finite when I was trying to learn this business and learn this craft. And you would go to the, the magazine stand, right? And you, and, and you, you were a student or you were a, a photographer, which means you were 
you had less money than you did as a student. <laughs> you were living in New York and, and you'd go through the magazine stand and you couldn't pick up the magazine and look through it. You had to be, okay, do I get Perry Match or do I get Italian Vogue? And because they're both going to be, you know, they're going to cost you basically the same amount that you'd spend on lunch. Mm -hmm. And so um, when you got that magazine, you, you studied everything about it. You studied how the images were used on the page, right. which images were used on the page, the sequencing of the image, what image was small, what was big, who made the images, what was the caption. And it, it wasn't just news, it was fashion, it was whatever, whatever you decided on that week to spend your money on. And since you, you made that investment, you had to, you were, you were, you had to get your money's worth. And so you'd, you'd absorb that magazine and then a week later you'd go back to it and do it again. And we don't do that with images anymore. And I don't know, I don't know if that counts for words as well. I, I think it counts for words. Right now we look at images on, on, on the internet less than the amount of time that we'd look at images on the advertisements in, in on the printed page, mm -hmm. you know the printed page. They used to say you have, if you're if you're a car company, you have 1.5 seconds to reach your audience in the pages of a magazine as they're going through the magazine and they see your ad. 1.5 seconds. We don't spend 1.5 seconds on an Instagram post. No, today. absolutely not. Yeah. We spend. 0.3 seconds maybe you know this um so how do you how do you how do you dissect an image how do you know every time every image i looked at and i still do this today i'd say how did the photographer decide to stand there what lens are they using why did they stand there when other people are standing someplace else would i have done a better job would i have made better decisions or would I have done a worse job? That's how I approach every image I see, um, even to this day. It's a constant thing. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we've taught, I don't, I think we failed to, and maybe it's just the medium itself. Maybe there, that's, that's why, you know, with the, the, the Curious Society, we're only doing a printed magazine. Mm -hmm. You know, like when you talk magazine. about the medium, because I'm, I feel like today when I see pictures, you know, I, I'm not being so much able to see the difference, you know, like uh, between the, the pictures and less and less, I see difference between the motivation of photographers. Because before, like, for example, you know, I, it was easier to, to, to at least feel the smell of a motivation. Yeah, yeah. You know, you could feel, you could smell it. It wow, well, well, yeah. you know that it, it, there is. You know, the first picture that I ever saw that I I I I, I thought that this is not photography. It was like James Natray picture on um, Indonesia of the guy being decapitated. The the man, and I was looking at a magazine. I was you know, and I I didn't have idea about photojournalism or nothing. And then I saw that man with you know this knife machete in, the, in, the, in someone's neck and looking to the camera to to me at least and I said my god this is not picture you know what what is that I, I I couldn't answer what that thing was and then I I could smell it so the person who were here must have a big motivation some you know for for being here and then but today you know that smell I mean that picture that James Latre was stinky motivation, was motivation at the fullest, you know. But you know, some pictures you could at least smell. That's well. But today I can, you know, less and less I'm seeing these motivations, you know. So we're working, we're working. And I'm with, uh, sorry, I'm talking also about like uh, not young photographers, okay? I'm talking about the industry, old photographers. I mean myself, I include myself yeah. in that. You know, what I mean, it's it's something that is general. I'm not talking about new generations today. I'm not talking about digital photography. I'm right. talking about you know, yeah. So there's 
there's so many um, there's so many ways to answer that, and there's so many questions there. And the first thing I'll say is, I never I never tell a photographer uh, I want to see what something looks like. Mm -hmm. I want to see I want I want them to show me what it smells like. So you're on the right track when you say you're not smelling it. That's a real thing, and because it has to be a, it has to be, it has to, it goes through you. You're 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 having an experience with this image, and it goes through your eyes. You know, smells go through your nose, but they're still going right into your brain, right? And we all know that smells. If you smell your grandmother's cooking, you remember everything about your grandmother, right? This, it's a real thing. And images, they're going through your eyes. And like I said earlier, I might not remember when we're sitting here talking, but if I go into the, the filing cabinet and I pull out some, some images, I will remember everything. So there is that thing. You have to... <laughs> it goes down to the, the very root of what you're trying to do as a photojournalist. Mm. And we've talked about, we've used the word smell. We've used the word curiosity a lot. And, you know, I think the word that you didn't, didn't mention with uh, Jim Nockway's picture is empathy. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Jim was, Jim tried to stop that mob. Um, just, you know, he, Jim doesn't need to make another picture of, of people being killed, right? But if he can, if he can have that empathy, not just for the person, you know, with the knife to his throat, but the crowd itself. If Jim can say, let's remember we're all humans here just for a second. In real time, while he's trying, you know, this is happening. Um, Youngie Kim was there too at the same time. And um, what you're doing, what that's saying to me is that photographer has has empathy for the human condition. Mm -hmm. Now, if they succeed or not, they're still going to make the picture. And then that picture is going to have that same empathy embedded in that that they had at that moment. Does that make sense? Yeah. You can't absolutely. fake that. You can't fake that. Yeah. And um Maybe that comes with experience. Maybe that comes with age. Maybe if you, maybe if you started out wrong, and and this is this is a this might this is a theory of mine. If you, and so it, I know you don't want to talk about the medium, but sometimes the medium does count. Mm -hmm. So if you're shooting with film. You're shooting, you're making pictures, you don't know what you have, you don't know what you don't have. So you're working, you're working, you're working, you're experiencing life through, you're still behind the camera, but you're still there. Mm -hmm. I think what happens in the digital world, as soon as you take that camera and you flip it and you're looking at the back, the real world Mm -hmm. The person that you just mm -hmm. photographed, they disappear. They become not an, an, a person anymore, but they become an object. That object yeah. you're looking at on the back of your camera, that photo is now an object. It's not a real person. Mm -hmm. I have, I had the I, same, man, what you're saying now, I had the same, exactly the same feeling, you know? Yeah. And I don't, I don't blame, I don't blame uh, a young photographer for uh, making that mistake. They've been taught to check the back of your camera, check your composition, check your exposure, do all, all these things. They can't help but do it. The camera, as it comes from the factory, is set up, you know, manufacturer standard to show them each click of the button, right? Mm -hmm. We can't, I think we have to get away from that. You see it in portraits all the time. As soon as, the, as, soon as you, you look at the back of the camera, you don't 
have that connection with the person you're trying to make a portrait of. And that person is now the subject, they're the object, they're, the, they're, they're a product, you know, um, and they're not a person anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, I think that suffers in portraits. It's the first place you see it. Ken, we have been talking now for an hour, you know, it went very fast. I had to finish this interview with a question that I'm making to everyone that I'm talking with here in this channel. Very two simple questions. And I hope you can answer me, help me to find an answer for that, which is like, what is photography and what have you learned from it? Right. Okay, so photography is 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 all that all that photography is is I saw this, I thought it was interesting. Let me show it to you. I think you might find it interesting as well. That's all we're doing, right? Um, what was the other part of the question? What had what have you learned from it? Oh. Yeah, so, so that's, that's, a, that's another, that's almost, um, so everybody, every young photographer, every, not every young, every young photojournalist, and many old photojournalists, they're, they all have, they think they're going to change the world, right? They think they're going to make a picture that's going to change the world. And Gene Smith is a perfect example, you know, he never stopped. It killed him, but he was he was mm. faithful in his um, resolve that his what he shared with people could change the world. And um, what what Gene I don't think realized, and what most photographers don't realize, is that photography, your photojournalism, does change the world. It changes the world one person at a time, and maybe you only change one person. But the first person that's going to be changed if you're doing this right is you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe it maybe I haven't, maybe I haven't uh, changed the whole wild wide world, but I've changed myself, I've changed myself to the fact that I don't have to run around the world, I don't have to, I can stay home on this little ranch and I'm happy with my children and I can appreciate that. Maybe that's, you know, maybe when I left Omaha, that's what I needed to learn. Okay. So you change, you change yourself. If you do it right, you change yourself for the better. If you do it wrong, it's, 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 it could take you to a very bad place. You know, we've seen that with photographers. Mm -hmm. um, so do it right, approach it with, with empathy and kindness, and never forget that, um, that uh, the person you're photographing is a person, and they have their same hopes and dreams, and, 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 and extend that grace to them. I think that's the word grace, right? Mm -hmm. And... Um, if you do that, then you will change the world. You might only change yourself, but that's a positive thing. But if you do it right, you'll change more than just yourself. You'll help somebody else make a, the right decision someday. And that little ripple, it's, it's important. Very well, brother. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. You're taking time to talk with me and, you know, you know, very, thank you. Thank you very much. You know, my pleasure and any time. And, you know, if I hopefully get back to, to Italy, then we can have a good meal together. You are more than welcome. We have plenty of space here, you know, <laughs> plenty of space and you are more than welcome here. Thank you. You. okay and, you, and you, you you as well out here in the middle of nowhere <laughs> <laughs> thank you brother take care bye bye, bye.